We're in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 11. Uh, Acts chapter 11. Last week we got all the way down to verse 18. Today we're going to finish the chapter. Um, put that someplace. As you read, you, you, you may well read through uh, these verses and you look at it and say, well, it's just a bunch of narration. He's just telling us a story. It's, it's just information. And, and it's true. Luke is giving us some specific information here. But there are some spiritual principles that are tucked away. There's some reality, some spiritual realities that are hidden there that I think are important for us today. Obviously, uh, they're important for us as Grace Chapel because here we are in the book. Uh, Anytime you get to a portion of the scripture, it's important for you for that day because that's where you're at. Uh, but there are some truths here that it's important for the church, the modern church today as a whole, that it would be well for us to, uh, to dig into. But as we know, chapter 11 has detailed for our instruction how the church in Jerusalem received and related to those those Gentiles who had accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior uh, up there in Caesarea and later on, as we'll see, in, in the city of Antioch. And the, the church in Jerusalem is faced with that perennial church dilemma. How to get along with the saints below. You say, well, what are you talking about? This, this term comes from an old poem that I heard Warren Wiersbe quote, uh, over 35 years ago, and, and the, 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 it's just a short poem. It's so profound. Uh, the truth that it contains is so appropriate for church life today. And because of that, it stayed with me all these years. The poem goes like this. To live above with saints we love. Oh, that will be glory. To live below with saints we know. Now, that's another story. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, we have the idea of how wonderful heaven will be. Well, guess what? You know who's going to be in heaven? The people around you right now. If you can't get along with them here, oh my goodness, how are you going to get along with them there for eternity? Obviously, that's not our problem, but it's been my experience in a lot of churches that I've been to that it is a, a common problem. Somehow we think, well, they're just going to be better when we get to heaven. Really? <laughs> Hopefully, you'll be better when you get to heaven. Uh, but that's, that's beside the point. Here are these Jews who have been Jews all their life now have to get used to the idea of hanging around with people who have never been Jews, who will never be Jews. Oh yes, they're Christians, but they're Gentile Christians. <laughs> this is the reality that the believers in Jerusalem were now faced with. And since the beginning of the Christian era, the gospel had been exclusively extended to the Jews. Tradition said that Gentiles had to first become Jews in order to be accepted into Judaism. And so that mindset persisted into the church. Well, if they want to become Christians, they would need to become Jews first. There were Gentiles that had been saved in the, in the, the 10 or so years before Peter went to Cornelius' house. But these have all been saved out of Judaism. Now, through the ministry of Peter, salvation has come to actual Gentiles in the person of Cornelius and his family, and the evidence of their faith was obvious, it was unmistakable, and it was the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that filling was accompanied with signs. And so, it's not like these Gentiles could have faked it. They wouldn't even have had a clue as to what they were faking. It was real. And while this new development initially caused some consternation among the believers back in Jerusalem, when they heard Peter's testimony of what had happened, uh, and his testimony was backed up by no less than six Jewish eyewitnesses, uh, the, church, the church in Jerusalem, they, they glorified God because what else could they do? They glorified God because they, they recognized that God was now working in the Gentile world just as much as he had been working in the Jewish world. 
And so the first response we see from the Jerusalem Christians is that they got to the point where this, they were willing to accept these Gentile believers. Now, granted, there, there will continue to be some disputes over the law, the keeping of the law, the observance of the kosher lifestyle, but there was never any question to the veracity of their salvation. But this speaks to the modern church as well. Christians today, no matter what your background, no matter what your nationality, no matter what your level of education or uh, how high you have uh, ascended in the uh, financial world, Christians are to receive one another as believers in Christ, brothers and sisters, and they are not supposed to argue or disagree over cultural differences or minor matters of personal conviction. Paul addresses this same topic at length in uh, chapters 14 and 15 of the book of Romans, uh, which we're not going to deal with today. If you're interested in that, well, you can read that for homework. Romans chapter 14 and 15. But we as believers today are called to follow the example of the early church and receive any and all of those whom Jesus has already received. If they're good enough for Jesus, hey, they're good enough for us. Amen? But acceptance wasn't the only response that the Jerusalem Christians had to the salvation of the Gentiles. As we will see in our text today, the gospel was beginning to make inroads into the Gentile world in other areas. Uh, because of the persecution in Judea, uh, these Jewish Christians were beginning to fan out all over the Roman Empire. And they were taking the truth of the gospel with them wherever they went, and they were sharing that truth to everyone that they met. And their testimony for Christ was having quite an amazing impact among the Gentiles, as well it should. This is something that the Gentiles had never heard before. See, Christianity isn't like any other religion. It's completely different. And, and the story of Jesus Christ and His willingness as God to come down and, and become like us, well, that was something that not only did the Jews have problems with it, but the Gentiles were like, how could that be? But the more they saw how Christians lived, the more they realized that the gospel was true. Now, word of this explosion of the gospel, uh, this explosion of new converts got back to the church in Jerusalem, as it always seems to. But how are they going to respond to this news? Well, let's look in uh, chapter 11, starting in verse 19, and see what's, what's going on here. Verse 19 says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, they spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So Luke continues his story of the expansion of Christianity into the Gentile world. And the catalyst for this expansion was the severe persecution that had come against the Christians in Judea. Now, as humans... We like to be comfortable. Uh, we like to know that God is blessing because everything's going great. Yeah, that's not necessarily true. Um, oftentimes, when God is blessing and things are going great, we encounter stiff competition from the world, from our own flesh, from the devil. We, the devil, we enter into a, a battlefield. And that's what the Christian life is. It's a battle. And if you're not battling something in your Christian life, I'd have to question the direction that you're heading in, you know. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing, because the, the, the fight's going to come to us from Satan himself. Well, maybe not Satan himself. Maybe somebody that works for him. I don't think I'm that important that Satan could take time out of his day to come bug me. But he's got somebody who could do that for him. And they do it quite effectively. And they always seem to be around, so I don't know. They, they must be getting paid overtime uh, because they are always there.
But just because there are difficulties in our life doesn't mean that we're heading in the wrong direction. Sometimes it does. Most of the time it means we're heading in the right direction. And these Jews in Jerusalem, they were, they were sharing the gospel and all that they got was persecution. And that persecution caused many of them to flee. But this was a good thing too. Because as they were leaving the city, as they were getting out of Dodge, as they were heading for the hills, they were carrying the seeds of the gospel with them. And everywhere they went, people were accepting Christ. Uh, but what we saw in the previous chapters that the, the believers initially moved up into Samaria, well, that's not that far away. You know, those, they're not really Jews, but they're not really Gentiles. They're kind of half and half. Uh, they moved into Galilee. There were a lot of Jews in Galilee. They, they went out along the Mediterranean coast. Uh, all of these areas had a large Jewish presence. But now we see they're la launching out into the deep, so to speak. They're going to locations that were well away from the heart of Judaism. They're going to places where, yes, they had Jews there, but they had a whole lot more people who weren't Jews. The vast majority of the populations of these cities were Gentiles. And these were not Gentiles that had been influenced by Judaism. No, these were outright pagans. You've got to stay away from the pagans. No, they didn't, they didn't think that. They went right to them. Now, the focus of our text here is in the city of Antioch. And <clears throat> just a little uh, history, geography. Everybody loves that. This particular Antioch was in Syria. Modern, today it's modern Turkey. But at that time it was Syria. Uh, and it is identified as the Syrian Antioch. And I say it's identified as the Syrian Antioch because at this time... There were about 16 cities named Antioch in this area. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, and I don't know if I pronounce his name right, is it Seleucus? Seleucus was one of Alexander the Great's generals when Alexander the Great died. He somehow or another through theft or murder or he, he gained part of his empire. And one of the things that Seleucus liked to do is he liked to go around and build cities, and he would build a city, and they would name it after his father, whose name was Antiochus. So there were a whole lot of cities named Antioch for some reason. Uh, I guess he couldn't figure out any better names. Uh, if you find something you like, just stick with it. I mean, that's the way I am. I go to a restaurant, I find something I like, I just eat that every time I go. That, it must have been the same thing for him. So by this time in its history, Syrian Antioch was a city of more than half a million people. It was located 300 miles north of Jerusalem. It was 20 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea. And it was considered by many to be the third greatest city in all of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> Antioch was mainly a, a city of commerce. It was a, a business city. All the wealth of the Orient flowed through Antioch on its way to Rome, be it the Silk Road or the Spice Road. Everything had to go through Antioch. And as you know, with a lot of commerce comes a lot of money, and with a lot of money comes a lot of power. So not only was this a, a business, a commerce city, it was also an important political center. But it wasn't just that. When you have a lot of power in one location and a lot of money, what else do you have? You have a lot of corruption. And Antioch was a morally corrupt city, probably second only to Corinth. Antioch was so bad that even the pagans of that day recognized that it was an immoral city. They recognized uh, its wickedness. Uh, Antioch had a cosmopolitan population. There were people there from all over. They came to make money. and It was kind of like a melting pot. There were different cultures, and all those people from all those different cultures dragged all their different deities into that location. Now, the local shrine was dedicated to the, the god Daphne, whose Worship included immoral practices. Outside the city was the Grove of Apollo. Uh, this was a grove of trees that served as an outdoor brothel. Uh, and it was to this city, this horrendously wicked city, that these 
persecuted believers brought the gospel. Uh, it did not offend them. Why did they bring the gospel to Antioch? Because they knew Antioch needed the gospel. And so here we see these Christians preaching not just to Jews. They started with the Jews, but there were others, some intrepid souls that say, well, we're preaching to the Jews. Why don't we preach to some of these pagans as well? So they weren't just preaching to Jews. They weren't just pe preaching to people who were part Jewish, part Gentile. They weren't even preaching to Gentiles who were God-fearers, who were familiar with Judaism. They were preaching to individuals that we would call utter pagans because Antioch was an utterly pagan city. So in verse 20, we see that there were some of them uh, were men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Luke doesn't give us their names. So these unnamed disciples from Cyprus and Cyrene are genuine heroes in, in my book <clears throat> because it was these individuals who began the first deliberate mission effort to the Gentiles. It says they came and they, they spoke to the Hellenists. These would be the, the Gentiles, the Hellenists in Antioch. These were individuals who were more Greek than they were Roman, but they were still Gentiles. And this is the first example that we have of Christians deliberately targeting Gentiles for evangelism, and their efforts produced some tremendous results. Verse 21 says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. <clears throat> Obviously, their, their ministry was blessed because the hand of the Lord was with them. But it's important that we recognize the power behind their ministry. You see, you can turn people to a personality. There are a lot of religious personalities out there. And people will turn to a personality, and they will do that without the hand of the Lord. You can turn people to a, a social club. There are a lot of them out there. And I'm not saying anything bad about them. You got the Rotary Club, you got the Lions Club. Uh, people will go there, but they will go there without the hand of the Lord being upon them. You can turn people to an institution. You can even turn people to a church without the hand of the Lord being upon them. But you cannot turn people to the Lord without having the hand of the Lord upon your, your ministry. There are a lot of options. There are a lot of things out there that like to distract us and, and take up our time. <clears throat> but if we want to see people turn to the Lord, we must have the, the hand of the Lord upon us, upon our ministry, upon our efforts. And these men uh, had just that. And because the hand of the Lord was upon them, verse 21 says, a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And that phrase, believed and turned, that's an accurate description of the necessary work of the Holy Spirit in producing both saving faith, they believe, and repentance, they turned to the Lord. So we see here a picture of saving faith and repentance in the hearts of unbelievers, and that's exactly what's necessary for someone to uh, accurately and honestly turn to the Lord. They must have saving faith but there also must be a willingness to repent. There must be a willingness to look at your life and say, oh man, that's bad. I do not want to do that again. Now, there's not saying that you won't, but the desire in the heart is that, no, this is wrong and I don't want to live this way anymore. But how can I do that? How can I stop being what I am? You can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can only do that by allowing Jesus Christ to come into your heart by allowing the Holy Spirit to bring new life into your heart, to change you from what you were to what you can be in Christ. And that's what was going on in the lives of these Hellenists as they heard the gospel, as they believed the gospel, and as they received it through repentance. Because God was with these disciples, because the Holy Spirit was working through these disciples, their ministry was blessed, and their ministry was multiplied. It says a great number of them believed. And that in itself should be encouraging 
but it can also be frightening. Here we have a great number of Christians, a great number of Gentiles who are Christians. Now what are we going to do with them? Because <clears throat> uh, salvation is just the beginning. Right? I mean, yeah, we want to see people saved, but that's just the beginning. There, there's more that goes into it than just salvation. Well, let's see what happened. In verse 22, Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Now we, we look at verse 22. Uh, we see that the news came to the church in Jerusalem. I don't believe there is anything untoward in this, in this statement. I don't believe that the apostles in Jerusalem had their spies out everywhere looking for new outbreaks of the gospel among the Gentiles. We've got to nip that in the bud. Or we've got to control it. We don't want these Gentiles getting crazy. I don't think that was the case at all. These unnamed disciples, they had come out of the church in Jerusalem. And so it was only right that they share the, the good news of God's work in Antioch with the church in Jerusalem. Now the, the leadership in Jerusalem... They still had a responsibility to shepherd the scattered flock that was out there, which now apparently included uh, some Gentile congregations as far away as Syria. Uh, they're, they're starting to get stretched thin here. So not only did the Jerusalem church accept Gentile converts as brothers and sisters in Christ, they were also now concerned for their well-being. They wanted them to not just be saved, but they also wanted them to be sanctified in Christ. They wanted them to grow in their faith, to grow in their instruction in the Word. They wanted them to be encouraged. And so they wanted to send encouragement to them. And who better to bring encouragement to these Gentiles than the son of encouragement himself, who we know as Barnabas. Now we've already been in introduced to Barnabas. Uh, we saw him at the end of chapter 4. Uh, Barnabas was one of, the, one of those guys in the new church that sold a piece of property and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet to help meet the growing needs of the church. We saw there in chapter 4 that his real name was Joseph, but because he was such an encouragement to the apostles, they just started calling him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. It's a good moniker to have. He earned it. Uh, Joseph uh, Barnabas, he was, he was a Jew, but he was not just a Jew. He was actually a Levite, which means he came from the priestly tribe. And if you want to find someone who was a stickler for a kosher living, well, it would be a, a, a Levite. <clears throat> but at the same time, Barnabas was also from the island of Cyprus, which was a Gentile area. And so although Barnabas was a prominent Jew, although he was a Levite, he must have been familiar with a lot of Gentiles. He was familiar with the, the racially mixed environment that he found in the, the church in Antioch. So we know that Barnabas was a generous person. We know that he was a great encourager. And the apostles called him Barnabas to acknowledge this wonderful spiritual quality. So it's, it's probably for this very reason that he was sent to Antioch instead of one of the other apostles. We don't know why they didn't send Peter. We don't know why they didn't send Matthew. They sent Barnabas. Whatever the reason, sending Barnabas proved to be a very wise choice. For one reason, <clears throat> when Barnabas arrived and he saw the evidence of God's grace on these Gentile believers, the Bible says he was glad. He was glad. You see, there was something going on in that work. There was something happening in the atmosphere among these Gentile believers that made Barnabas able to see the grace of God in their congregation, in their lives. And there's a principle here for us today as well. In whatever gathering of Christians that we choose to associate ourselves with, it is important that others be able to see the grace of God amongst us. That other people can recognize it. 
See, when people walk through the doors, they should never see an emphasis on self. You know, self-promotion, self-aggrandizement. You know, I'm important, everybody else is not. They should never see an emphasis on man-made rules. Oh, you've got to live this way, you've got to do this, you can't do that. They should never see an emphasis on human performance. Oh, you've got you to toe the line or else, you know. You're not, you're not really our, our type of Christian. The emphasis on our gathering should always be on the grace of God. And if it is, if it's real, if it's not manufactured, because you can't really manufacture it. You know, you walk into some place and they're just trying to be nice. You know, they're just trying too hard. You know, if you're not a nice person, <laughs> trying doesn't really help. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> But if the grace of God is real in the congregation and other people are able to see it, you know what? It's going to make them glad as well. Now we might say, well, of course he was glad. Why wouldn't he be? God was working. People were being saved. But remember, this was an entirely new situation. And it wasn't a foregone conclusion that a Jew, <laughs> in particular a Levite Jew, would rejoice in what was going on in Antioch. I mean, who knows? Barnabas could have, he could have opposed the preaching to the Gentiles altogether. Or he could have just accepted it begrudgingly. Like, uh, I guess if, you know, like, like Jonah. Oh God, if I guess you're going to save this city, you might as well save it. You know. Don't listen to me. If God is determined to include the Gentiles, I won't stand in his way. Well, that's really nice. That's really, that's really encouraging. But Barnabas didn't react that way at all. Matter of fact, those thoughts never crossed his mind. When he saw the fruit that the gospel was bearing in this Gentile community, he was delighted. He was beside himself. He was ecstatic. He was encouraged. These were not his people. This was not his hometown. This was not his home church. This was completely foreign to him. But God was working, and Barnabas was pleased to see God working. But here's the thing. Barnabas didn't show up there just to check up on them, just to see what they were doing. No, Barnabas came to help them, and help them he did. And true to his nickname, Barnabas encouraged these new believers. Maybe he thought, well, if God is working, maybe I should get to work too. That's always a good idea. If you see God busy doing stuff in your community, in your neighborhood, in your church, in your workplace, yeah, maybe, maybe, why not just join in? Pitch in and help. Put yourself to work. God could always uh, use you as, just as much as he could use anybody else, right? Because it's not us. It's the power of God working through us. All God needs is a, a willing vessel so he can pour into you and you can pour out to others. Barnabas said, well, let's just get busy. And he began to exercise his gift of encouragement. And he began to strengthen these new Gentile believers. And he did so with an emphasis on having a dedicated heart. You see that in verse 23. He encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. With purpose of heart. That means that they must do this on purpose, deliberately. You know, we have the idea that I'm going to surrender my life to God and, and He's just going to work in my life. You know, I'll just sleep through it and when I wake up, oh, I'll be much better. No, that's not the way that it works. We don't become sanctified by osmosis. I'll just uh, rest and one day I'll wake up and I'll be better. No, it doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit has to do the work but at the same time, we must cooperate with the work that the Holy Spirit is doing. We must apply ourselves. We must enter into that sanctification, that growing in our faith. We must do it deliberately, on purpose, every day. Can you believe that? What does God expect? Well, He expects us to have a purpose of heart. But notice He says that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. Now that phrase, continue with the Lord, is not meant to imply that these Christians, these Gentile believers, that they were to keep themselves saved. 
That's not the case at all. You see, the grace that saves us is also strong enough to keep us. So that's not what Barnabas is saying here. That's not what he's teaching here. Continuing with the Lord carries with it the idea of loving the Lord, uh, walking in His ways deliberately, obeying His word deliberately, serving Him with your whole heart. Continue with the Lord means that we belong to Him alone, and we should cultivate our devotion to Him. We should put some effort into it. You know, there are things that we can do to make our relationship with the Lord that much more intimate. We need to understand He's done everything that He possibly could do to give us an intimate relationship with Himself. He sent His Son to die on the cross. My goodness, He sends His Holy Spirit into our life to, to, to give us new life. He gives us the faith to believe in Him. He gives us the grace to be saved. He's done everything that's necessary. So why aren't we in experiencing that intimate, close relationship with Him? Yeah, because somebody's been slacking. Somebody's been slacking. So we should cultivate our devotion to Him. And we as believers today, with purpose of heart, should continue with the Lord. That's why we meet together regularly. The more you know, huh? The more you know. It's all in here, but how are you going to get it? Yeah, you get it by reading it. You get it by studying it. You get it by coming together and, and hearing the Word of God preached in uh, corporate Bible studies where we, uh, you know, bounce ideas off each other and argue amongst ourselves good-naturedly and laugh at one another for their silly ideas. No, we don't do that. Yeah, well, kind of. We do it in a good heart. But it's, it's, a, it's something that you enter into on purpose. Now, why did Barnabas respond in such a positive and encouraging way to the salvation of these Gentiles and not in the other ways that we mentioned? Well, the answer is found in verse 24, where we have the equivalent of a spiritual profile of the man. Verse 24, Luke tells us that he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Because of Barnabas' efforts to encourage the church in Antioch, even more people were added to the church. Was it because Barnabas was going out there and winning them? No, he was teaching the people in the church and they were going out and winning their friends and family members, co-workers. <clears throat> now Luke tells us that Barnabas was a good man, which I find to be interesting because in Luke's own gospel, chapter 18, verse 19, you remember the story when the rich young ruler came to Jesus. He, he had a question for him. The rich young ruler approached Jesus and he called him good teacher. Which was the equivalent of saying good man. And Jesus looked at him and he said, hey, why do you call me good? There's no one good. That is, there's only one good and that's God. Why are you calling me good? Now the point that Jesus is trying to make here is that if this young man wanted to learn something from him, he needed to have a higher view of Jesus than just a good teacher. Because the reality is, Jesus is either the good God or he's not that good of a man. Either <clears throat> Jesus was God or he didn't need to be talking to him. And yet here, we don't have time to get into that story, that's a whole other message in itself, but right here Luke calls Barnabas a good man without any difficulty, without any embarrassment. How can he do that, knowing that there is no one good but God? Well, the answer follows immediately in verse 24. He was a good man because he was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Barnabas wasn't good because he was a good guy. He was good because he had the good Holy Spirit filling up his life, calling the shots, so to speak. He was full of faith. He had the Spirit of Jesus Christ within him, and he had faith, which is a fruit of the Spirit. 
And it was because of the presence of the Spirit of Jesus within him that when he arrived in Antioch, he was able to rejoice at what was going on there. The Spirit within him was bearing witness with the Spirit in those Gentile believers, and he rejoiced in the marvelous work that God was doing among them. How could he not? They both had the same Holy Spirit. But this brings up an interesting question that I think we should spend just a few minutes dealing with. What is the filling of the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> or let me ask this question. What does it look like in the life of a believer? Sadly, most Christians today believe that the filling of the Spirit is always accompanied by some demonstration of the gifts of the Spirit. And in our day and age, in our culture, most commonly that refers to speaking in tongues or some demonstrative healing or some prophetic utterance. And we're not going to get into that today because I have quite a few things to say about that. <clears throat> but this is the modern view of being filled with the Spirit. But what does the Bible say? How does the Bible uh, describe the filling of the Holy Spirit in the life of of the believer. We've already seen in our study of Acts that, that one of the premier evidences, one of the premier proofs of the Spirit's filling is the ability on the part of those filled to magnify the Lord, to glorify God with their witness, with their voice. Someone who's filled with the Spirit is always talking about Jesus Christ because that's one of the roles of the Spirit is to point people to Christ. They're always able to praise God no matter what the situation. We saw that back in chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. The, the, uh, the disciples were in the upper room. They were filled with the Holy Spirit in a dramatic way. And what did it cause them to do? It caused them to get out of that upper room, go out into the streets, and just share the gospel. Yeah, they did it in some unknown tongues. That, but they were sharing the gospel. They were praising God. They were e expressing, declaring the truth of God and His glory. We saw it in chapter 4 after the, the apostles had been beaten for preaching in Jesus' name. They went back to uh, the church. They had a prayer meeting. The Spirit came upon them and it says they, they, they spoke the word boldly. That was the evidence of the filling of the Spirit. They were able to speak the word of God with boldness. Even after you know they were still gingerly putting their jackets on because oh, they were bruised. But that didn't matter. They, the Spirit had filled them and they were able to speak the word. We even saw it in chapter 10 as Peter was preaching to Cornelius. The Holy Spirit had the audacity, the audacity to mess up his message and he fell upon Cornelius and his family and they all started speaking in tongues. But they all began to magnify the Lord. The filling of the Holy Spirit compelled those who were filled to praise God and to declare His glory. That's one of the evidences. But that's not the only evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Uh, if you will, turn to Ephesians uh, chapter 5. Uh, it might be, uh, David might have it up there for you. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. I want to read through this real quick. Because this also uh, gives us information on what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18 says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Whew, that's tough. I'm all for singing. I'm all for thanking. What you mean now, submitting? Eh, it's going a little bit too far there. Now, <clears throat> Paul is kind of giving us some insight into this subject. Uh, verse 18 is actually a dual command. He tells, us, he tells us not to be drunk with wine, but do be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul is contrasting the conduct of the world, which is the tendency to, to be drunk, with the expected conduct of Christians and the Christian condition. We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, while there is a contrast there, a noticeable contrast, there are also some similarities. If a person wants to stay drunk, what do they got to do? Well, they got to keep drinking. Well, guess what? If you want to continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what you got to do? You got to be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time deal. We must continually be filled. And the grammar that Paul uh, uses clearly states this. Be constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why do we need to constantly be filled? Because we're broken vessels and we leak. We lose. And so the Holy Spirit must come upon us on a regular basis. We must seek that. We must ask for that. We must put ourselves in that position to be filled. Now, once we're filled, what does it look like in our life? Well, the rest of the passage reveals what the filling of the Holy Spirit actually looks like. The Spirit-filled life is marked by worship, a willingness to worship. It's marked by gratitude, giving thanks always. And it's marked by a mutual submission. And he goes on in the rest of the chapter. Husbands or wives submit to your own husbands. Husbands love your wives. Submit to Jesus Christ. Uh, children, submit to your parents over and over again. Wait a minute, all this stuff is just too much to... No, that's why we need the filling of the Holy Spirit. And when we have it, that's what it looks like. And that's not all. There's actually one more evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit that is found in our text, although it is not easily seen. Let's read on verse 25. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. <clears throat> now here we learn something else about the man Barnabas. Something for which he should be praised. Something for which he should be emulated by believers. Something that is rarely seen in ministers today. Another clear proof that the true spirit of Jesus Christ had filled Barnabas' life was the fact that he was, I'm going to use this big word, he was self-effacing. What does that mean? It means he was modest. It means he was unassuming. It means he didn't put on airs. He didn't like receive a title and stick with that. Hey, I'm the, I'm the guy in charge. Now, remember, he actually was the guy in charge. I mean, Barnabas was the official delegate from the Jerusalem church. He was there at the behest of the apostles themselves. You can't get much higher of authority than the apostles, other than Jesus. Barnabas was probably one of the more prominent figures in the church at Jerusalem. And as such, he, could, he would have been well within his rights to be authoritarian in the way he handled this church. He could have said, I'm the official representative from Jerusalem. I'm going to tell you how to run your church. And you need to do what they do in Jerusalem. And then you need to report to me so I can report to them. He could have well done that. And that happens quite often, too often in churches today. But again, Barnabas didn't seem to have that spirit in him at all. Because we saw that when he arrived, he rejoiced at what was happening, and he encouraged the work that was happening. And the result of this was a great many people were added to the Lord. And now we see it wasn't the Gentile church that needed help. It was Barnabas that needed help. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do with all these people? He had more people there than he shake a stick at. And he didn't even have the stick. So here we have a, a new church that was a mixed church, but it was a mixed church that had very little knowledge of God's Word. And that can pose a problem. When you have a large group of people who think they're following the Lord, but they don't know God's Word, oh my goodness, where in the world are they headed? What did they need to keep them from going off into one crazy direction after another? What did they need? They needed some sound teaching. They needed teaching that was grounded in God's Word. But to have that, 
They needed someone who could teach these new converts. And who could do that? Who was capable of leading these Gentiles through a systematic study of Old Testament doctrine? They had never read the Bible in their life. They had never heard of the Old Testament in their life. They didn't know what the Pentateuch was. We all know what the Pentateuch is, right? It's the first five books of the Bible. It's just a big word for the first five books of the Bible. <clears throat> but here's the problem. Barnabas knew what his gift was. It was to be an encourager. It wasn't a teacher. At least not to that degree. So even though Barnabas was basically in charge, he knew he wasn't the one to teach these converts. But there must be someone. There's got to be some. God would not have brought all these people together and not have provided us with someone to teach them. And then he remembered years ago that guy that he met in Jerusalem, old Saul, better call Saul. There's a guy out there. I know he could teach these, but where is he? Oh, you know what? He's in Tarsus. So get, get what's going on here. Barnabas is in charge of this church, but he's willing to let this church fend for themselves for just a little while while he goes off to Tarsus to find Saul. Now, the language here says that he didn't know where Saul was. He had to go to Tarsus and he had to look him up. He had to find where he was. It took a while to travel there. It took a while to find him. But when he found him, he was like, hey, dude, I need your help. I got a mess of Gentiles over here that know nothing about God. And I need you to help them. I need you to teach them. Now, this had been probably 10 years since Saul had accepted Christ. And he has been in Tarsus for quite a while. Nobody knows what he was doing during that time. But we do know that he was busy about the Lord's business. It's quite possible that he started the, 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 the church in Cilicia there. It was quite possible that a lot of the troubles, a lot of the persecution that he writes about in some of his epistles occurred during this time. Because he wasn't the kind of guy that would sit down and shut up. He had the truth, and he was going to deliver the truth no matter what. And so one day, Barnabas knocks on his door. Hey, buddy, how about let's go to Antioch? People over there need to be taught. You want to do some teaching? And Saul agreed. Verse 26, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so it was that for a whole year they assembled the church and taught a great many people. Wow. That's Bible School 101 right there. Yeah. Who wouldn't like to have the Apostle Paul to be your professor in Bible school? Now, I actually had uh, the life of Paul, and the professor was quite uh, engaging, but it would have been a lot different to have Paul himself. Of course, he'd probably be talking about things that you might have to bring that down a little bit more to our level. But uh, Paul was game. He was game. And it says, for a whole year they taught. Now, notice what it says. They, they taught a great many people. But back in 24, it says a great many people were added to the Lord. Same phrase. What that tells me is that all those people that accepted Christ in verse 24 were all taught by Saul and Barnabas during this time. None of them fell away. None of them were lost. None of them were left behind. No Christian left behind. But Paul was willing to do this. So instead of retaining his position of prominence and risk uh, watching the fruit wither on the vine in the church, because there are a lot of people who are willing to, hey, I can't lose my place. Whatever happens, happens. But hey, I've been here. I've been put in this position and I'm, I'm going to stick with it. Even if it kills the church. But Barnabas goes out of his way to search for and bring back a man that he has known for years and a man that he recognizes as being just the one to help this church. So Barnabas is willing to lay aside his privileged position for the spiritual benefit of other people. Wow. Where have we seen that before? Is this not exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us? 
I'm going to turn to this well-worn passage in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8, because we need to hear it again. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And I refer to this passage so often because I need to be reminded again and again what the Spirit of Jesus Christ actually looks like. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you're asking to be filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And if you're going to be filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ, guess what? You're going to be expected to look like and act like Jesus Christ. Jesus was willing to set aside His glory to come to our world and to die for us. He lowered Himself to become like us so that we might be raised up to become like Him. And exhibiting this spiritual quality is probably the greatest evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit that a believer can know, that we can see in another person's life. You see these people who claim to be filled with the Spirit, and yet they're also really great self-promoters. Well, that, those two things don't really go together. Because the Spirit of Jesus Christ is self-effacing, it's modest. It's willing to put others first. It's willing to submit to what God wants to do. Now, did this work? Was Saul the solution that the church in Antioch needed? Apparently so. For an entire year, they gathered and they taught. And this seems to uh, have really taken hold in this church. Because <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas, they did this as a team, and that's exactly how it should have been done. But the results of their efforts here in chapter 11, the results of their efforts lasted for centuries. For centuries. The church in Antioch eventually became the center for great biblical teaching, for great Christian Preaching. Some of the greatest Christian preachers of the second century, of the third century, of the fourth century came out of the Syrian Antioch church. And so the investment that, that Barnabas made in these people, his willingness to set aside his prominence to bring someone else in to do the teaching, it all paid off. It paid off handsomely for the kingdom of God. This church was grounded. It was from this church in this wicked city that the missionary efforts around the Roman Empire began. It was Antioch that sent Paul and Barnabas out. It was Antioch that sent Paul and Silas out and Barnabas and Mark. They began to send missionaries out all around the world. Why is that? Because these were Christians who were pagans at one time. And they wanted to see other pagans experience what they had experienced salvation forgiveness of sin freedom from the the darkness and the blindness that pagan religions holds on the the lives and the hearts of these people so it's not by accident that here in antioch a church of many races led by the dual ministry of paul and barnabas that the term christian became associated with the followers of Jesus Christ. So the Latin suffix I-A-N means belonging to the party of. So in this case, Christian means belonging to the party of Christ. Or it means you are Christ ones. Or you are Jesus people, which uh, is a term we're more familiar with. Now, the term Christian has lost a lot of its significance over the centuries because many people today consider themselves to be Christians simply because they're not pagans. Well, I'm not a pagan, so I must be a Christian. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, I mean, yeah, you might belong to a church. You might attend services 
regularly. You might even occasionally give, but it takes more than that for a sinner to become a child of God. It takes repentance from sin, and it takes faith in Jesus Christ. And now for those of us who are saved, we must be willing to not only take on the idea of having the title of Jesus people, we also must take on the responsibility of living our lives in such a manner that's worthy of being called Jesus people. See, it's one thing to be a Christian. It's another thing to be worthy of the title, to be worthy of the name. And that's my, my constant prayer is, Lord, make me worthy of everything that you have given me. Because I'm not. I mean, let's just face it, we're not worthy. But he makes us worthy. And he, em he empowers us to live in a, a worthy manner. So real quickly, verse 27 through 20, or for 30. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. So there was uh, coming and going between the two churches. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. And this they also did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now this is not really a throwaway passage. Uh, there's a lot going on here that we don't have time to talk about today. But this, this passage so, shows us how the Christians in Antioch functioned. Uh, they functioned with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we have an individual here named Agabus. We're going to see him later on in the book of Acts again. Uh, Agabus prophesied that a famine was coming, and the famine did come. I mean, Luke tells us that he prophesied. And then he tells us that it actually happened. And the famine was, was actually severe in the, the, the region of Judea. So how did these Gentile believers respond? Because these Gentile believers were filled with the spirit of Jesus, <clears throat> they immediately asked themselves, well, what would Jesus do in this situation? And the answer that they came up with is, well, he would try to help. Matter of fact, because he's Jesus, he would help. There would be no try. He would just help. And because they figured that Jesus would help, they determined for themselves that they were going to send some relief to the believers in Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, a lot could be said about prophecy and how it worked in the church. A lot could be said about collections, but time doesn't allow for us. What we can say is, that as far as we know, this is the first charitable act of this kind in all of recorded history. For the first time, one race of people took up a collection to help another race of people. As far as we know, that had never happened before. Why is it happening now? Because of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ that makes all the difference in the world. And I mean that literally. It's because of Jesus Christ. It's because of Christianity that we even have hospitals, that we have orphanages, that we have charitable organizations that assist other people. Now, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of charitable organizations out there that are not run by Christians, but the idea started with Christianity. The idea that we can help others simply because they need help. That didn't exist before Christianity. It didn't exist before the church. And here we see the introduction of that right here. It is the work of God in the hearts of people who are, uh, I don't want to embarrass anybody, I don't want to offend anybody, but by nature we are selfish. By nature we, uh, you know, I have what I have, and if you have some, I'll take that too. You know, what's mine is mine, what's yours is mine. That's really what we, how we operate. When Jesus comes into our life, he brings new life. He brings new nature. And our nature now becomes his nature. And it's his nature to give to other people. His, it's his nature to help others. So Antioch was the first place where believers were given this name. <clears throat> they were first called Christians in, in Antioch. And no wonder. 
They were a loving, uh, a never before seen group of people in that area. But <clears throat> it is also true that in another sense, these Gentile believers were Christians first of all. Yes, they were called Christians first in Antioch. But it's also true that they were Christians first. Even before they were Gentiles. They were Christians before they were Gentiles. They were willing to help the Jews back in Judea. Now these guys could have been Gentiles first and Christians second. And they could have said, well look, we're Gentiles, they're Jews, let God take care of them. You know, they're God's people, God will take care of them. Why should we send money to the Jews? They could have been pagans first and Christians second. Meaning they could have said, well, why should we worry about anybody but ourselves? But that's not what they did. They were neither of those things. They were Christians first. And because they were Christians first, they felt a bond with all other believers. And they were determined to help them when the need arose. And they did help them. And they would continue to help them. We'll see this later on in Acts. That the, the, the Gentile churches were continually sending gifts to the church in Jerusalem. Only because of Christ. Let's stand. <clears throat> How about you? Are you a Christian first? Is your Christianity, if you, is your relationship with Jesus Christ the most important thing in your life, the most important thing about you? Are you happiest knowing that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? I mean, these are important. We see that that's, that's what characterized the church in Antioch. They were Christians first before anything else. And because they were Christians first, the gospel went forth. And it was effective. And people were saved. And God blessed it. And if you're a Christian first, if you determine in your heart that no matter what decision you need to make, no matter what action you need to take, you're going to do it as a Christian, well, then God will be able to bless your efforts. And there will be others who are brought to Jesus through your witness. It cannot be any other way than that. When the gospel goes forth, under the power of the Holy Spirit, it will have an impact. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for your word and the truth that has been revealed to us there. And Lord, we ask that you allow these things to sink down into our hearts. Lord, we don't remember everything, but help us to remember the important things. Lord, help us to remember to be Christians first. Help us to remember... Uh, what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To prefer others before ourselves. To be obedient to your word. Submissive. Lord, help us have a desire to be filled and to be constantly filled. And help us to see your word go forward and be effective as it was amongst the pagans in Antioch. Lord, we've got plenty of pagans out there in our own town. We've got plenty of people who think they're Christians, but they're not. Lord, help us to carry your truth and your love together and share it with all that we come in contact with. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit do your work in their lives. And we, we thank you, Lord, in advance for what you're going to do and what you're going to accomplish in our community and we praise you for being in our lives we praise you for your work that you've done in each one of us we thank you for your truth your word and your love we ask all these things lord in christ's name we pray amen, amen.